Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles and open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you need a Bible, there are Bibles in that middle section there on tables. You can certainly use a Bible app on your phone or your tablet. But we're going to look at an important passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of the most important passages in the Bible about the resurrection. The resurrection is the teaching and the truth that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he is alive today, inviting you into a relationship with him through the blood that he shed on your behalf. I mean, imagine that. You can have your sins forgiven today and all the guilt and shame in your life removed because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on your behalf. Notice what it says here in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, How do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith also is in vain. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. Verse 16, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is empty and you are still in your sins, which is a miserable condition, by the way. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And that's worth repeating, isn't it? But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Our salvation depends upon the truth that Jesus Christ is the sinless son of God whose death paid for our sins and whom God vindicated by raising him from the grave. Without this, we have no sinless savior. We have no high priest who always lives to intercede for us. We have no forgiveness, and we have no hope of being raised from the dead ourselves. And again, we agree with the writer here, Paul, when he says Christ is risen from the dead. It was a difficult day, the day of the crucifixion. We gather on Fridays. It's called Good Friday. And so each year we gather on the Friday before Easter to commemorate and to talk about what could be called the worst day in the life of Jesus. I mean, this is the day he was betrayed. This was the day that he was arrested. This was the day that he was beaten. This was the day that he was hung on a Roman cross, the day that he died a torturous death. You could say that that was the worst day of his life. But you know, the Bible, when it records these true stories for us, It's very important when you're reading the Bible to remember this fact. And that is the people that you're reading about did not know what was next in their life. They are living their lives in real time, just like you and I live our lives in real time. They did not know what the future held. Just like today, you don't know what the future holds for you in some of the situations that you face. So it becomes very ironic, does it not, that on the worst day that you experience, that God could come in and take the worst day and actually make from it the best. It's a very ironic thing. I mean, I would even say, I would go far to say that for some of you, it's an impossible, it's impossible for you to even believe that. It's so hard for you. It's like, what are you talking about? Do you even know pain? Do you even know difficulty? Do you even know suffering? You're telling me that the worst day of my life or the worst week of my life or the worst month or year or many years of my life, you're telling me that God could take the worst and bring the best? Well, you know, the resurrection, truthful, the truthful account of the resurrection is God doing just that. But it's not just the resurrection. The Bible is filled with the true stories of men and women where we get a glimpse of the worst day of their life, but also we get to see how it ends. 
And we see how God took the worst and he brought out the best. I, I think of someone like Joseph. Now, some of you are unfamiliar with the Bible, but there's a guy in the Bible, his name is Joseph, and the bottom falls out of his life. It starts in his family as a young man, sibling rivalry, anger, but to the, to the worst degree. They, they put him in a pit, they dig a pit, they throw him in a pit and leave him to die. And then one of the brothers go, you know what, let's not leave him to die. And instead they sell him into slavery. And being sold into slavery, he finds himself in a home where he, he's very effective as he's a home steward, but then the wife of the guy he's working for accuses him of a sexual crime he didn't commit, and he's arrested, thrown into prison, falsely accused. He's in prison hoping that God will remember him, but he's forgotten in prison for many years until finally he is released and he ascends the throne of Egypt and God uses him to bring about the savior of the world through his faithfulness. You know, it would have been impossible for him to tell, for you to tell Joseph, hey, look, bro, I know it's hard right now, but you're gonna be on the throne one day. One day God's gonna use this. And you're like, oh, I don't know, man, not today. You may not be so familiar with Joseph, but I bet you you're familiar with Job. Job is a well-known man that we read of in the scriptures. And this brother, he loses everything rapid fire. He loses all his possessions, his children die. He gets sick, he loses his health. He has the worst of the worst condition. His friends come to encourage him, but are a, even a greater discouragement. It's like not what he needed. His marriage is in shambles. His wife is hurting. I mean, it's a mess. It would have been really hard to tell Job, hey bro, you know what? It's really hard right now, but not only will God restore all these things to you, but your story, your true story, will be used to help encourage thousands upon thousands upon millions of people for the rest of eternity. Yeah, the worst turned into the best. Let's fast forward a little closer to the life of Jesus and a very close follower of his by the name of Peter. Peter was the kind of guy who was all in. Do you know anybody like that? Just all in. Like there's no halfway for him. So when he decides, he's in. But then of course, a person like that tends to make a few mistakes along the way, might become a little impetuous, and that's Peter. He, he was unstable in many ways. He was growing, and, and he came to a place where Jesus himself looked him in the eye and warned him, you're gonna deny me, but he's so caught up in his commitment and perhaps a little pride that he says, oh, no, no, not me. And he looks at all those guys around him. He goes, everyone else will deny you, but not me. And what happens with Peter? He denies Jesus once, twice, three times. I mean, this is a man, you have to understand, in following Jesus in the first century is a little different than how you and I experience it today. Those that follow Jesus in that first group, they left everything. They lost everything. They sold everything. I think the closest equivalent that we may see today is a, a missionary that says, I want to go to another, and they just sell their house, sell their possessions, and they invest their life in reaching a people where that's, that's what it was like there. So for, for Peter to blow it and throw it all away in one moment you know, he's dealing with the same thing you and I deal with when we blow it, and that's guilt and shame and regret. It's all throughout the Bible. I mean, how much of a worse place can you be than to be in the pit of shame and regret? And man, you're just like, what did I do? And what, what kind of person am I? And, and you, how could you have told Peter in the worst part of his life, hey, you know what? It's gonna get so much better for you, Peter, because Jesus is gonna find you. He's gonna re-enlist you in ministry. You're gonna become so powerful. You're gonna even write a couple books in the Bible. It's, a, it, it's okay, it's gonna be, this is a bad time now, but there's things better up ahead. But it's true. It's true for every single person listening to me right now that has born again and has a real relationship with Jesus. What you're facing right now is not the worst. God can take even the worst well, the Bible says he can work all things together. And he can, and he will, and he is. But I have to say, for those of you, for those of you among us that would say to me, you know, I'm not really into this, you know, I'm not really, I'm in church, like I'm kind of in church today because they forced me to, you know, I'm here, but I really don't want to be here. Well, I'm glad you're here. And if they promised you lunch, make sure you get your lunch today. 
You know, if there was anything they said, you come and I'll do, make sure you get it. But for the moments that we're here together, I'm glad you're here. And it's okay if you don't want to be here. It's okay if you want to be somewhere else. It's fine. Because God will use the time that you said, and you, you kept your word, or you came as an invitation. I want you to know that God will use it at the very least to tell you, like I am right now, that he loves you. And that he loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on your behalf. An exchange, perfect for imperfect. In Bible words, righteous for unrighteous. Oh, more Bible words, sinless for the sinful. And anytime you walk into the walls of a church building, it's important that you recognize that sin is a big problem. And it's not just a big problem generally, it's a big problem for every single person. What will you do with the reality of your separation from God? And it may be that the worst day in your life or the worst week in your life or the worst year in your life has now gotten your attention and you're beginning to ask the important questions about life. Questions like, where will I spend eternity? Where is my help on earth? Where is my hope on earth? And we're reminded this Easter weekend of the power of the resurrection. And when we're reminded of the resurrection, we're not so focused on the event as we are the person. Uh, the resurrection's amazing, so important theologically and practically for our lives. But we can't lose sight talking about the resurrection. We can't lose sight of Jesus, the eternal son of God, who resurrected, who came and lived for you and died for you. I mean, that's a historical fact. There's really no debate. I mean, some people like to argue, but for, the people, for most people, there's really no debate that Jesus lived and that he loved, and that he taught, that he was crucified, and even buried. Truly, there's no debate, even though some might want to excuse it away, but even trying to make an excuse for the resurrection admits that it happens. But there are those that would, I mean, it's, it's not even up for debate that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. There were witnesses. There were, when we read in 1 uh, Corinthians, if we kept reading, there's an episode where 500 people saw him at one time. That's a powerful witness. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But you think the worst day of my life could be turned into something good. It's just hard to believe. I acknowledge, I, I, I get it. But you see, the greatest tragedy of all history and time proves to us that God can take something really bad and bring something really good. You know, when you think of the life of Jesus, the life of Jesus is very divisive. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. The life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus is very divisive. Jesus himself, when he's teaching us, told us as much. I don't know if you knew this was in the Bible, but listen to what Jesus says. This is in Matthew chapter 10. Listen to what he says. He says, don't think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. His love, his life, his teaching, very divisive. Why? Because it brings us all to a point of decision. Everyone has to make a decision with what they know about Christ. And everyone listening to me right now knows the fullness of the gospel as it's already been shared with you, the good news that through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, your sins can be forgiven. You have to decide. Now, of course, most of our audience today, most of those listening in have already made that decision. You're born again. But I wonder how many of you haven't really been living for God the way you know you should. It's not enough just to have some point in time back 20 years ago when you received the Lord Jesus Christ and started to serve him a little bit. And, and there you are in a home where, yes, you're very moral. And yes, you're very good. And yes, you're very law abiding. But are you saved? That's the question. Now, if you are good and you are law abiding, 
and you are a moral man or a moral woman, thank you. We need more of you. We need those of you to good, that are good to be gooder. And yes, pastor made up a word for you. Pastors do that from time to time, but I want you to remember it. It's, it's wonderful that you're good, that you've chosen to live a moral life. It's wonderful that you want to make a difference in this world and have, a, have the world, if Jesus doesn't return, have the world be a little bit better for the next generation than it was for you. That's wonderful. But what have you done with Jesus? That's the question. The resurrection makes us, it forces us to think about these things. And I know over time, especially in our culture, but really around the world, Easter's become about something that it's not about at all. You know, you have the eggs and you have the, the bunnies and you have the candy, I'm not opposed to candy, but all the candy that's available. But you know what? That's not Easter. It'd be wonderful things to enjoy family and do some things outside. That's great, but that's not Easter. Easter brings you face to face with the life of Jesus, but also the death of Jesus. You know, the death of Jesus was pretty divisive too. Hey, can you imagine being on the earth and only doing good and only serving and only caring and that there were people on the earth that wanted him dead? I mean, that was why they, they, they wanted him dead. A lot of people didn't want him dead, but some did. And they were, some of them that wanted him dead were successful at influencing the Roman government to give him the death of the worst of the worst criminal, this innocent man. And it was divisive. Some people said, oh yes, he's in the tomb. We can get back to our regular religious life and don't have to worry about the implications of hearing his teaching and seeing him face to face. But others, they cried. They were brokenhearted. And like the disciples, you know, one of the reasons why it was the worst day in their lives, the death of Jesus, is because they abandoned him in his greatest time of need. I mean, there's so much emotion going on during this time that we appreciate because so much of our life is filled with emotion, challenges, regrets. You know, not only the life and death, but also the resurrection of Jesus brings division. It brings about a decision. And you, some of you listened to earlier what Jesus said, I can't believe it. Jesus would want chaos to happen in my family. He doesn't. He's just stating a fact. Some will believe and some won't, and it will bring great pain into families. Those that reject Christ, part of the consequence of that is great difficulty and hardship and challenge. And when it comes to the resurrection, the life that Jesus was buried and three days later rose again from the dead, instead of uniting the world, instead of bringing people together under the banner of King Jesus, the, re the resurrection sealed all of eternity for choices to be made where the percentages are, most people reject Jesus. Even sometimes they'll start out well, and then over time, the world and the things of this world and just life, she's like, I don't want anything to do with Jesus, but that is a choice. And you will live with the consequences of that choice. And by the way, that's not God's heart for you, for you to turn your back on him. It's his heart for you to come back. You know, before the crucifixion, Jesus was very popular. But after the resurrection, I mean, his, his popularity went through the roof. Everybody was talking about Jesus. You couldn't help it. There were people that agreed, don't agree. The buzz on the street was about that man from Galilee. I mean, if the disciples had social media, you know, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, hey, check it out. Jesus, he's right there, right there. I mean, if they had the technology we have today, it would just be around the world in seconds. Indisputable. But in their day, it was indisputable. Witness after witness after witness after witness. And you know, the difficulty, of course, is that we can't talk to those 500 people or literally thousands. Like Jesus, literally. If they had phones back then, we'd still have pictures and everything. I'd be, you know, everything on the internet is permanent. It would be permanently there. We'd be able to look it up and say, there it is, there it is, there he is. But they didn't have that then. Instead, they had eyewitnesses. And 500 at a time is pretty significant. You know, if you got, let's say you had two at a time, and you go, ah, oh, you guys, you know, you're not credible. Okay, 20 at a time, yeah, you know, you can make it up 20. Okay, 100 at a time, well, you know, you're pressing it. 500 people. I saw him. I touched him. I hugged him. 
I watched him. I followed him over, over, and over again. But the problem is we don't get to talk to them. But I suggest to you today, although we can't talk to the 500 that saw Jesus personally, if we went through this room and we asked people about the power of the resurrection in their lives and the testimony of God's work in their life, you know what you find in this room? Witness, 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 witness of the power and presence of God even to this day. I would be, since I have the microphone first, I would be the chief witness of the power of God and transforming a life. And you go, well, that's not true. That's just you. You just, no, man. No, 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 no. You weren't there. I was there. I live that life, I, I have that testimony, and you can argue all you want with me, but I was there. That's an eyewitness testimony. People that see it, and again, there's testimonies all, there's witnesses all throughout this room. You see, the life of Jesus, it draws out. It's important that you realize that it draws out a decision. There's only two decisions. I mean, Jesus said starting things all the time, you know? Jesus said that one time, uh, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a pretty exclusive statement. You know how the world, you know, and maybe you've said this before, maybe you believe this, but it's like, oh, don't worry about it, pastor, Christianity, Buddhism, everything. All roads lead to God. All roads lead to God. So I'm just going to check, you know, I'm just going to choose one of the roads and we'll all end up there. Well, you may be surprised, but there's part of what you said. I agree with you. I agree with you. Choose whatever road you want. It's going to lead you face to face with God. For sure. Absolutely. One day, you will meet your maker. One day. And you, will, you must give account for your life. All roads lead to God. But don't confuse all roads leading to God Don't confuse that with all roads lead to life. That's a whole different topic. All roads do not lead to life. Jesus said there's only one way to the Father, just one way. It's not two, it's not three, it's not five. It's only him. It's not through a particular church or through a particular denomination or some pastor's word or what, whatever has been substituted for a personal, vibrant, surrendered, sacrificial life that has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit following Jesus. That's the only way to life. There is no other alternative. Jesus said something that you either believe him or you think he's delusional. You think, well, you know, that's just what... That's just what you believe there, Pastor. No, man. Do we need to call another witness? It's the truth. And what's important in a culture like ours today in a very challenging generation is to remember this. The truth is the truth, no matter what you think about it. There isn't your truth and your truth and you live your own truth and you do your own thing. You, that, that, is, that is popular and it's comfortable. It's just gonna lead you to disaster. Nobody drives that way. Nobody, like if you look at everything in life, you're just like, well, I'm going to do my own truth and I think I can drive on this side of the yellow lines. You're going to kill somebody or yourself or both. Why? Because there's a truth when it comes to driving. There's a truth when it comes to relationships. There's a truth that's not open for interpretation And Jesus says the same thing. He calls you and invites you to follow him personally. The bottom line is that no one, no one in the first century could have avoided or sidestepped making a decision about Jesus. And you know, not much has changed today. Easter is always a neat time for pastors, you know, because if you ask any pastor around town, they'll tell you it's one of their most favorite times of the year. You know why? Because churches are filled during Easter. I mean, even here, we had, to make all, we had to add all kinds of services to be ready for the capacity of all of you that are here that maybe you haven't been here for a while or you're visiting from out of town and we're just like, yes, yes, we will make room for you. We're so excited. Easter, when those that study such things will tell you that Easter is typically the most well-attended day of churches around the country. Do you know what the least attended day is? The week after Easter. Because I think God's just like, okay, pastor, pop your head and get back to reality. 
that you're just serving one person at a time that's in front of you. Because it's not about attendance, it's about life. It's about ministering to people one at a time. Pastors need to learn that. God always has his ways to teach us. Pastors are excited because they're preaching the gospel to more people. They're ministering to more people. It's so exciting. It's so wonderful because lives are changed. Lives are changed. And men and women are brought to decision just like you are today. In a few moments, I'll give you the invitation to respond to that. But before we get there, I want, to cons- I want you to consider a few things about the resurrection that will encourage you and really stir you up. For those of you that are born again, these are yours already. You don't need to work for them. You don't need to earn them. You don't need to buy them. They're not in some Bible study series or in a book. These are yours by default as a son or a daughter. You have inherited these. You receive them as a gift. However, if you are apart from Christ today, these are not yours yet. So it's almost like you're looking on, you're coming in from the outside, kind of looking in, which by the way, last night after one of the services, I was talking to a gentleman and he was telling me about, man, pastor, that was that, you described my life, man. I was like looking, I've been looking from the outside. I've been outside kind of looking in on everything and I just need Jesus in my life. And that could be you today. So the things that I'm about to share with you in relationship to the benefits of the resurrection are, belong to every true believer. Number one, number one, listen. The resurrection assures me that I'm accepted by God. That's a pretty powerful gift, that I can, I can know that I'm accepted by God. The Bible says this, he was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. I want you to tie this together, and if we had all day, I'd develop it for you. But I want you to tie this together, okay? This is so important, especially the way we're living right now. Acceptance with God leads to understanding your true identity. Your true identity. Isn't that the big wrestling and trouble today? There are so many people wrestling with their identity, wondering who they are, trying to answer that question. The the popular wrestling with identity today is sexual identity. Wondering who I am and how am I to present myself and how did I, and and it's, it's, it's so confusing. And that's the case, isn't it? Those of you struggling with your sexual identity today, that's the case. Nobody knows but you how confused you are and how hard it is. Because you know, God has already settled your identity for you. He created you in his image. You don't need to worry about everybody's definition of who you are or who you're supposed to be or how you're supposed to present yourself because God has done that for you. But you know, when you, when, you, when you have God out of your life, then you become very confused of who you are and who you're supposed to be. And, and then all these loud voices, it seems like the people that are screaming and yelling the loudest get your attention. And then you become part of a little group that seems to be so popular, but they're not as big as you think. And they're just a small little group. And you go, oh, I feel like I belong here, but only for a time. You see, the way the world accepts is you're accepted until you're not. <laughs> Anybody experience that? You're accepted till you're not. Not so with God. The resurrection assures me that I'm accepted by God. That he takes me as I am. And he begins to work in my life on the inside. Number two, the resurrection assures me that Jesus is for me and not against me. That's a pretty powerful truth to think about it. In Romans chapter eight, the Bible says, what can we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't God who gave us Christ also give us everything else? This is another place of confusion because those that might take a position of, you know, I'm a moral and upright person, you wonder why there's so much friction, why there's so much unsettling about your life because you're really trying to live a good life. But you failed to ask the most important question, and that is this, how good is good? How good is good? You go, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, if you are created in the image of God, then how good do you need to be? I mean, how is it? Is it a, on a scale of one to 10? Can you just be a five? Is that fine? Is it okay to be a seven? Do, do you need to be a 10? And if you have to be a 10, do you need to be a 10 every day? Because you know as well as I do, you are not a 10 every day. 
I mean, even this morning you were kind of crabby when you woke up. Like it's, it's the way life is. So we know we can't hit 10, but I'll tell you what God says is that what I require of you is a 10. God says, I require perfection. And to which we say, but I can't give that. To which God says, well, I will give my son on your behalf. Perfect for imperfect. The great exchange. God's not against me. He's not working against me. I don't have to be mad at him. I don't have to fight him anymore. I can trust him with my life. Even the worst days of my life. Because he's not at war with me anymore. He's my friend, Jesus said. Which is unbelievable. Number three. The resurrection assures me that my sins are forgiven. Which is our biggest problem. That's our biggest problem. Even if walking in, whatever we're facing today, we might think, oh no, Ed, this is my biggest problem. No, it's not. Your biggest problem is what have you done with sin? What have I done with my sin? You know, I know it's hard to hear that word. I've used it a few times, but you need to hear it. Maybe you haven't really addressed the issue of sin so much in your life, but I do know this. If I ask the question, how many of you well, let me ask it this way. You can just say out loud. Are there any, are, are there, if you can say yes to this, if you do, someone did first service, but we'll, we'll get all over you if you answer yes, but that's fine if you want to. All right, you ready? Is there anyone in the house that is perfect? Okay, well, that's good. That's good, because we had a brother over here. Yes, and I'm like, whoa, we need to talk to you after service, bro. <laughs> How about this question? You can say it yes if it's for you. Is there anyone in the house that has made mistakes? Oh, really? Is that true? Made mistakes. You know how easy it is for us to admit that? I mean, it's pretty normal. Like, yeah, I make mistakes all the time. Stumble and fall. I say the wrong things and such. And you agree so quickly about making mistakes. But here's the reality. If you took that word mistake as we're talking about it now and you apply it to God, God would call that a sin. And it's much deeper than some little mistake, you know, taking somebody's lane or thinking some random thought. Like this is, sin would be defined as an offense to a a righteous, perfect God. And it's unforgivable apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the only way forgiveness comes is through the blood of Christ you won't be able to take your life and erase the mistake. It's already been done. You can't change the past. So because you can't change the past, God says, then what will you do with your future? And on the cross, on the cross where Jesus died, he died for all the wrong things I've ever done, all the wrong places I've ever gone, all the wrong thoughts I've ever had, all the wrong words I've ever said. Jesus became sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Righteousness for unrighteousness. The great substitute. Fourthly, the resurrection assures me that I have all the power I need to live the Christian life. That's very important because contrary to public opinion, the Christian life is not easy. In many ways, it's more difficult to live a life for God in a world that's increasingly hating hating God. Like in a world that hates God, it makes living for Christ much harder, much more challenging. Not only do you live in this world, but you also live in your body. And your body craves sin, whether you like it or not. I mean, so it's so bad at times. It's so bad that Paul would write in the Bible, he'd say, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I do, I don't want to do. And he's like, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And then he says, I thank Christ Jesus. He's the deliverer. But we live in this body. So like we're tempted all the time. It's not easy. But you know, God has given you the power to live a life that pleases him. What he requires, he empowers. I think of in the the world of addiction, you know, because addiction can really, really, uh, in, you know, just take someone in and envelop them in darkness. Because especially when you're wanting to come out of it and you re- finally come to the realization, I can't live this way anymore. I don't want to live this way anymore. And here's what happens. You're like, I, I, I don't want to do it, but I do it. 
I'm doing it, but I really don't want to do it. I get, I get a few days sober, and then I go right back. I, I avoid that on the internet, but I come right back. And it's just so overwhelming. The world, the system understands that. There's no power in this world. There's none. So what do they do with, when it comes to alcohol and substance abuse and addictions? What do they do? You, you come and say, I've been sober for a year. And what do they say? Well, you'll, you know what? You're in recovery. You're in recovery. Like you're never going to end. It's never going to end. But I'm telling you right now, if you're born again in Jesus Christ, the moment you are born again, you are recovered in that moment. You are set free. You don't have to live fearful of sin. You don't have to live, well, you know, maybe one day I'll stumble. And one. No, you're delivered. You want to live that way? Go for it. Live the delivered life. It's not a lifestyle of forever. You're going to have to look over your shoulder because sin is chasing you down. You're free in Christ. And the resurrection reminds me that even if temptation comes and even if bad days return, I have the power to live in a way that pleases God. Every born-again believer has the same thing. Finally, the resurrection assures me, this is so good. This is going to be so encouraging to many of you. The resurrection assures me that after I die, I'll live forever in heaven. I have eternal life waiting for me. But not only that, if that wasn't enough, check. if that wasn't enough, for some of you, it's very special. And, you know, he's like, how can you be more special than Jesus? Well, God gives you just a little bit part of your heart that says, not only will you live forever in heaven with Jesus, but you also be reunited with those that you love that died before you in Christ. So there's going to be a heavenly reunion. It's just such a, it's such a beautiful gift from God for every man, woman, and child that have decided to receive the forgiveness of their sins. This is no small thing, the resurrection. And it's no small thing, Easter. It gaps all of our attention for the moment and Jesus invites us to follow him. For some of you, it's gonna be for the very first time, but others of you, God is saying, what are you doing turning your back on me? Why are you doing that? What are you getting out of it? How's it or even in some ways, how's it working for you? What, what has replaced the intimacy and the closeness and the care and concern of God? What, you have, what have you exchanged God's great love for you? The temporary pleasures of this world the, the uncertainties and difficulties. And, and, and again, what will you do? You're taking, you know, sometimes at this, at this moment in the study, you know, whether we're having a regular service or whatever, like there'll be people that it's like, you know, in their hearts, they won't say it out loud, but in their hearts, they'll say, oh, I'll just take my chances. I'll take my chances, pastor. Uh, finish up, finish up, finish up. That's not my watch. Finish up, finish up. See the time, you're about done. There's no service after this. I can go all day. So we lock the doors. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> it's like, but, but you're like, you know, what, what's the, I'll just take my chances. You know, no, nah, don't, don't, no, 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 no. It reminded me, it came to my mind last night. You know, I'm a dad. I raised my three, kid, my three kids into adulthood. And, and it'd be like a dad saying, you know what, son? You know what, daughter? Don't do this. I've already gone down that road. I already know how bad it is. I already know what's going to happen. Like, like, and for you, it could be even worse, but, but don't do this. And, and your kid coming back, well, you know what, dad, I'll take my chances. What's a good dad going to say? No, no, don't take your chances, man. Trust me. Isn't that what you're going to lean on? Trust me. I've been there before you. I, I, I've already gone ahead. I've already lived that life. Trust me. You're, you're kind of banking on the reality of just trust what I already know. So how much more would God come to you today and say, trust me, trust me, God, my, my creator, the one who died for me. Like he's like, I've already gone that, I already know how that ends, trust me. And so to the, those of you that might be thinking, I don't know, maybe there's a new phrase these days, but you're like, oh, I'll take my chances. I'm telling you, please, that, that is not the decision that will lead you to life. You, you know, the fragility of life, you know, nobody knows. Do you know the Bible describes life, even if we live a full lifetime, like vapor? It just like, whew, here today, gone tomorrow. And life is so fragile that none of us know. None of us know. We want to live today while we're alive now for the things of God. 
You know, those of you that, live, that work in the medical community, those of you that work for police and fire, you know this is, this is, this is your life. Stepping in to save lives, to protect life. So please don't take chances. Come to know Jesus today. Surrender your life and remember the resurrection, the power of God to change your life. So Father, I pray as we turn our attentions toward the rest of our day, Lord, you know, we're going to be just like the disciples. They're going to live life. They're going to, they're going to have life. There's, there's a normal life to be lived, but the question is how will we live this life you've given us, this gift? And I'm grateful, Lord, as I'm just reminded all, all day yesterday and today, the power of your resurrection, reminded of the power you brought into my life and the life transformation testimony and all throughout this room of your life-giving work among us. And for that, we're grateful. We sing about it. We clap about it. We laugh about it. We experience joy. And we're so grateful, God. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to invite you to do just that. Choose. There's only two choices, right? You're for him or against him. You're living in surrender to him or in rebellion to him. But I know some of you, God has really been speaking to you through this time in his word and saying, that's you, that's you. And so if that is you, I'm gonna ask you where you are. Would you just stand to your feet? I wanna pray with you and I wanna help you for the very first time receive the forgiveness of your sins. So right here in this room, if that's you, respond. Let today be the day that forever changes your life. Join the family of God and know that you know where you're gonna spend eternity and like really have purpose in life. And so if you're here today, that's you. Just stand to your feet so we can, I'm, gonna, I'm calling you publicly because that's what Jesus did. Like everywhere he went, says, you wanna follow me? Come on. And you had to be, like there was a, there was a, um, a real obvious turn in their lives. God bless you guys. Who else would say, that's me? Today is the day, the work of God in your life. It's unbelievable what's in store. Bless you in the back. And I mean that as a pastor, right? It's not just church talk. I truly mean God's blessings upon your life. That you will leave here a different woman and a different man. And you know, sometimes these, these moments, they get to be like an argument with the pastor. Like, well, you know, pastor, and you know. Like, don't, it's not about me. Even if I delivered it in a way like this, I could have done better, that's fine. But you still know that God loves you. But it's not about me. It's not arguing with me. It's God's work in your life. Bless you guys in the back. Over here on the side. Yes. And it's a good time if you guys are down in the overflow rooms. Uh, we have pastors in, down there to take care of you as well. Out on the radio, I mean, imagine that driving through Colorado and today's the day that God reaches you through radio or flipping through YouTube. Amazing how God works today. So pastors, uh, come on up and connect. You guys that responded publicly, you're going to have a pastor or one of the men in our school ministry come and stand next to you so that you know that you're not alone in this church that one of the core values of this, of this church, but I think the church of Jesus is community. And you're not alone. And I want you to have that tangible understanding of God's love for you with a pastor standing next to you. And knowing that there will also be the one that will follow up with you and connect with you and help you. And so I want to help you fulfill uh, part of the Bible. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So I want to help you with that by talking to God, which really just means prayer. That's if you ever heard the word prayer, all that word means is talking to God. And so you can say something like this. You could say, God, I admit that I've sinned against you and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. 
I believe that you sent Jesus Christ to live for me, to die for me, and to rise again from the dead to save my soul. And I'm choosing to turn my life away from sin and to follow you. And God, I know it's such a high and holy moment. Lives transformed in front of us. We we aren't even sure what the future will hold and how you will use them and what your plan is in their lives, how you want to redeem and how you want to rescue how you want to save and how you want to add and how you want to subtract, but we are eager to find out. So bless those that turn to you today, God. May it be real and genuine and transformative. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Bless you guys.